2 Kings chapter 22 is where our scripture is going to be taken from today. In the early part of this chapter, <clears throat> King Josiah began, uh, began a project. He felt led of the Lord to rebuild the temple, and so he began to, to do this. And uh, uh, verses 1 through 7 of chapter 22 talks about that. But his mission was to restore an old run-down, cluttered temple. And that's what the Lord told him to do. Now, it's so interesting here because the several previous kings before him does what the Bible says evil in the sight of the Lord. And so the best I can trace it, uh, Josiah's great, great, and maybe great-grandpa followed the way of the Lord. But about two or maybe three uh, generations before that begin to do what, what the Bible says is evil in the sight of the Lord. And in that time, just, just a couple generations, huge difference. In the 18th year, that Josiah was ruling. He instructed his scribe, or his secretary, to go to the temple and begin to collect money from those that took the money. We call them Bob. I mean, we call them ushers. I almost call them Bobbies. <laughs> we call them ushers. Now, he says, take this money and give this money to the ones that have been charged to oversee the every day of the temple. Verse 7. I want you, I just, before we get into it, I didn't know if I was going to mention this or not. Before we get into it, chapter 22 and verse 7, I, I, I couldn't help but notice it said, Howbeit there was no reckoning made with them of the money that was delivered into their hand because they dealt faithfully. And I begin to really, you know, spend a little time on this and study it and read it. And I begin to think about all of our folks. And, and basically what it's saying, go down there and get the money, but you ain't got to count it. You ain't got to keep up with it. You ain't got to do nothing. Why? Because those people are faithful. Amen. Now, I'll tell you something. I, we, we count our money, and we put it up on the board, and, and we have a paper trail for every penny that gets spent. But you know what? The people, when I think about our ushers, I'd trust them. I'd trust them. The folks that pays our bills, and the I'd trust them. If I didn't know where a penny was at, I would trust them. If, if, you, if you don't, they probably shouldn't be doing that job, right? But I, 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 just, I got to thinking about all the people that, that the things that we don't even know, that we don't even see goes on, the counting and all that. You know, the rest of us is out fellowshipping and talking and trying to figure out where it is we're going to go eat. I'm sorry, I got sidetracked there. I thought I got to think about what I was going to go eat. <clears throat> but, uh, and they're in here counting and such, you know. I thank the Lord for them. Just want to point that out. Now, because of Josiah's um, desire to rebuild the temple, basically it was this. He wanted to be obedient to his Lord. He wanted to do what the Lord told him to do. So it was during that time that uh, Heliah, the high priest, found the book of the law. So his secretary did what he did, was supposed to do. The priest went into the temple and they began to do this. They're paying folks to come and you can read about all about it in there. Uh, masonaries, uh, construction workers, doing it all, rebuilding the temple. And they find a book inside the temple. Imagine that, finding the law of Moses what they had then, what we would consider the Bible, imagine finding a Bible in the temple. What in the world was they talking about before? If I didn't have the Bible, what would I say? Well, I'm going to give you three points why I'm right on everything. I mean, what else would I say? You know? So, I just find that amazing. Now, the Bible tells us in this story that the high priest found the book of the law and began to read it. And the Bible says that he took it back to the king. 
And the king began to read it. Or his secretary, his scribe, began to read it for him. And the word of God, just the word of God, wasn't a powerful preacher, didn't have three points in a poem and all that stuff, just began to read the word of God, and it began to speak to this king. So much so that the Bible says he was distraught. He was disturbed. He's like, I hadn't heard about this. Why haven't I heard about this? The Bible was not read. The book, the book of the law, the book of Moses, this book was not read. I thought about, you know, there's kids. David said this when, when he taught uh, a couple Sundays ago. There's kids that don't hear the Bible. I can't imagine that. There's parents that don't teach their kids the Bible because the parents don't care about the Bible. How many generations has to pass to that entire family is just ignorant when it comes to the Scripture? And I use ignorant in a, in a respectful term because they just don't know. And the king's like, where has this stuff been my whole life? I've been ruling. And I hadn't heard about this. I didn't know we were supposed to be doing that. And so it made a difference. So... Uh, the Bible tells us that he began to do it, and revival broke out in the land. And uh, <clears throat> the Bible tells us that he tore his clothes, he was distraught. And verse 19 shows us that he humbled himself before the Lord. Verse 13 tells us that he sent messengers to inquire, because he wanted to know what the Lord was saying. He wanted to know what it was that God had for him. And so verse, verse 14 tells us that he sent messengers down, and, and the messengers went down to the prophetess. And you can say the word prophet there, or you can say the word prophetess. Uh, King James uses prophetess because it's intended for the female form. But let us take note that the root, root word means the same thing. So, went down to the prophetess, and she told him, what it was that God wanted him to know. Now we thought, well, wait a minute. I thought women were supposed to be silent in church. Yeah, yeah I'm, I ain't talking about our women. <laughs> and, and, and this got me thinking. I talked to Geraldine just a little while ago. You remember Baptist Men's Day? And I said, you know what? We need a Baptist Women's Day. What's that Sunday? What's the second Sunday in March? Anybody know? What's the date? The 12th? That's going to be Baptist Women's Day. So y'all, you ladies begin to pray. And what is it that the Lord wants you to say? I didn't say preach. I mean, you don't have to preach. But I want to know what God's been speaking to you. Now, God has laid a sermon on my heart already for that day. And I can't wait to preach it. But, you know, we'll have a women's choir. We always like a women's choir, don't we? That way, a lot of the folks that don't normally sing in the choir comes up. I always like that. But you start thinking about it now. Just like the men, I would like for you to come up here and get behind this podium so that it'll pick you up. If you don't feel comfortable, we'll set you something, something up over here or set it down there. But either way, without the microphone, you know, folks won't be able to hear you much. Just think about that. All right, I'll move on. Chapter 23 is going to describe to te begin to describe to us how this revival took place, what happened. And so uh, for now, my attempt is, is to only do this, and that is to instruct us all in three different areas in, in things that we need to do pertaining to this story and how it relates to us, okay? Because if we want revival, if we would like to see revival in our church, is there anybody interested in seeing revival in our church? Okay, good. I'm glad I'm not the only one. And so, but what does that mean? What does it mean? Hey, I want revival in my church, but let me ask you something, church. What does that mean? What does it mean? It means I mean we got to... You fill in the blank. What does it mean to have revival in the church? Folks getting right with the Lord? 
folks being dis- d- distraught, be- folks being so disturbed at the way things are in this world, things that, that, that we're so distraught because there's room in these pews. We're, we're so upset because there was only 50 in Sunday school. I believe revival is when, you know what? Coming to church and worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ is the most important thing that I'm going to do this day. I don't care what I invent. I don't care what I go through. I don't care what I do. I don't, it doesn't matter. The best thing that I'm going to do today is I'm going to pick my family up and I'm going to come here and I'm going to go to church. Now, I'll tell you something, church. All you, all you got to do is stop and think about it for a little bit and you'll understand what I'm talking about. You can't make somebody. There's folks right now that's not come to church and for many, many reasons. Many, many reasons. Some folks don't want to come to church because they come under conviction. There's other reasons. And you understand that. And I understand that. But I want the most... I, I get so excited. Let me tell you something. I was down. I was so down. Miss Linda, you know, Linda's the third person that gets here on Sunday mornings. I don't know if you know that or not. I get here, and then usually Larry gets here. He wasn't here today. She's number two. And I was up here, and I was getting ready, and I thought, I know Miss Linda will be here in a little bit, and I'm going to have her pray for me. It means so much. It means so much. I could not wait till she got here because I knew that I got a sister-in-law. I know she prays for me every day. I know many of you do. But I thought, I got a sister in the Lord. And then, then we got to talking about this right here. I thought, man, I can't wait the rest of the folks get here. I can't wait. I want to be around my church family. It's an encouragement. If I couldn't come here and do this today, I don't think I can make it. Right? I hope you feel that way. That, to me, that's what revival means, that, w- that we begin to care. It's upsetting to me that there's spaces in these pews. It's upsetting to me why we don't have to have two or three services. Because I know we sing about the Lord and we preach about the Lord. And I know this church is a loving church and a giving church. And like Brother David said, there's people out there that needs to be sitting in these pews that needs to be loved on like this church does when folks come. And I believe it's time for us to go get them. And I mean... Literally, go get them if we have to. We need names. We need people that says, I'll drive the van. We need people that say, I'll ride on the van. Why aren't our rooms full of kids? There's kids that are... God help us. God help us. There's families... Sitting there and says, I don't think nobody loves me. It makes me want to just, let's just get up right now and let's go knock on some doors. Let's cancel church one Sunday and go in our community and go to them. We want them to come to us. That'd be great. I think, I think it's time for our hearts to break. And like King Josiah, I think we need to get a little distraught. I think, it, I think we need to be a little more upset I think we need to be a little bit more concerned about the lost in our community. Amen, church? I really do. Now, as I said, and and I begin to look in 2 Kings chapter 22, and and look, and and I'm just going to read verses 8 through 10. The Bible says, And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, Lord, have mercy. Help me, Jesus. I need need bigger letters in my Bible here. I'm sorry. Let me read that again. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law. I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. That moves me. I can't get beyond that. I can't get past that. I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And he began to read it. And verse 9 says, And Shaphan the scribe 
Shaphan, Shaphan the scribe, came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it into the hand of those that will do the work that have the oversight of the house of the Lord. And Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest had delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king. We'll look at a couple more things in just a minute, but I just got three very simple things that I think that we need to uh, understand this today. And I, did, I, really, I really didn't title uh, this sermon, but if I was, it would have been, Is There Dust on Your Bible? Amen. If you saw on the overhead, you know, earlier, I just had a Bible that said, Read Me. I don't know if it bothers you or not, but, you know, so many times... You'll go through the parking lot at the grocery store and you'll see in the back of the car Bibles laying up in the back of the car or in the seat or up on the dash. Hey, I think we need to keep it with us, but, uh, you know, if it stays there the whole week and doesn't come back out to the next Sunday, that might be an issue. You see, if we look at this passage of Scripture here and if you and I, as a church, if we desire to do what is right in the sight of the Lord then we will go find the book. That's it. Number one, go find the book. That's exactly what happened here. They wasn't even looking, at, looking for it. The Bible says that they were, uh, they were just sent by the king uh, to rebuild the temple. And I believe the Holy Spirit came, told uh, King Josiah, I want my temple rebuilt because he made a promise that he would dwell in there forever. And so... That's what happened. Go find a book. There's three questions I want to ask you this morning pertaining to you going and finding the book. When you get the book, let me ask you a question. What place does the Bible have in your life? What priority do we place on God's Word? And number three, is the presence of God's Word a factor in our daily living? Now, this past week, we had a pretty good discussion, several folks. Um, and... Many, many people think, and, and I want to I make sure that everybody knows how I feel about this. You, you see me every week. I always preach out of the King James Bible, and I probably always will. But if you think this is the only translation of the Bible that God has ordained, you're wrong. Now, you're just flat wrong. I love the King James Bible, and I'm going to use the King James Bible. But there's people that says to protect God's Word that this is the only translation that God has ordained. And that, that's just sad. And I saw folks begin to uh, comment and, and, and everything. No, my attempt today is for us to understand that we need to go find the book. And I'll be honest with you, I don't care what translation you use. For me, I will continue to preach out of the King James Bible, but I use a bunch of them. And sometimes quote other ones. I'm asking you this question. What place does the Bible have in your life? What priority do you put on God's Word in your life? Is the presence of God's Word a factor in our daily living? Is it making a difference? You see, many bad things had happened in the previous couple generations, as I've already uh, mentioned. Both Manasseh and Ammon, his, his dad and his grandpa, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And I had to go back and read. I can't remember. There's so many kings' names and I can't pronounce their name, you know. But either three or four, but, but, you know, back, things were going good. In fact, if you go back in chapter 18 and 19, you can see where folks, a uh, king cried out to God. He was going to die and he cried out to God. And God says, I'm going to let you live 15 more years. And it goes on and on and on. And then just after that, boom, they go right back. And then just a couple generations later, here's King Josiah. Listen, our country, our country is in danger. We're, we're, just, we're just a generation or two away. We can't let that happen. You see, the problem is there was a loss of God's Word. There was a loss of God's Word. If you, as, as I mentioned, going back to chapter 18, you know, Israel had been in captivity. They were rescued. They were in captivity. They were rescued. You know, God was always saving them. And so uh, all, that, 
all that relied on this fact, though, that they were disobedient to God. It, it come with the fact that they were disobedient to God. And then we move on as we begin to uh, move back into our story, and, and we see that it happens over and over and over again. Well, let me ask you this, or let me, uh, let me uh, say this. Uh, I looked it up. It was on my mind. I looked it up because I wanted to get the exact dates. June 25th, 1962. I'm pretty sure I wasn't even thought of then. <laughs> the United States Supreme Court decided in Engel versus Vital or Vitali that a prayer approved by the New York Board of Regents for use in schools violated the First Amendment by constituting an establishment of religion. 1962. The next year in 1963. Oh, what a night. Late December, back in 63. Somebody, a couple of y'all are getting that. And so, some of you are like, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, the 30th for me, but that, but, you know, Righteous Brothers. Oh, what a night. Okay. Um, the following year in 1963, in the Abington School District, Pennsylvania, Versus skimp, the court disallowed Bible readings in public schools for similar reasons. 1962 and 1963. And I believe that these two landmark decisions coming from the quote-unquote Supreme Court and other courts, I believe, began the destruction of America. So there was in this time and there is a loss of God's word but I want to mention this too because there's also a lacking of God's word because some people would say well there's not a loss of God's word I've got my Bible I've got two or three of them we don't have a loss of God's word then we have a lack of God's word two different words with two different meanings now we're privileged we're honored Things like getting to do the Good News Club. I think about that a lot because when we're in the auditorium there at Blue Ridge Elementary and we're doing our thing and uh, we're singing or the lessons being taught, there's kids walking back and forth the back of the uh, uh, stage the whole time. You never know. You never know what God might use to echo down the hallway to touch somebody's heart. We are inside the public school having Bible study and worship. That's pretty good. For how long, I don't know, but we'll keep doing as long as we can. We're, we're blessed. We're blessed that our schools um, still allow the Gideons to go in, which, by the way, March 5th, the first Sunday in March, that's Gideon Day. We'll have a Gideon speaker, and we'll be taking up an offering to put the Word of God in people's hands. Because it makes a difference, right? We're privileged, but we're also lacking. This is where the church comes into the picture. So yeah, let's bring the Gideons in. And let's do an offering so they can buy more Testaments. But you know what? We can't just leave it up to the Gideons. We've got to be involved too. You see, what happens here is this. The people rediscovered the Word of God. And you might be in a place in your life where you're just now starting to rediscover the Word of God. If we want to do what's right in the sight of the Lord, you know what we need to go do? We need to go find the book. The second thing we need to do is go read the book. Go read the book. Not only did they find it, but they read it. I saw a saying one time that said, a dusty Bible is a dead Bible. Well, the Word of God is alive. The Bible says it's sharp as a two-edged sword, and so, but it doesn't do us much good if we're not reading it, is it? These folks found it. They found the Word of God. And they did a couple things. Number one, they rejoiced. They rejoiced. We take it for granted, don't we? Be honest. Be honest. I, I've got so many Bibles. I've got two rows over there and, of, of different Bibles. You know what? This is my preaching. I've got a Bible. It's just my preaching Bible. Because I don't want to write in it or something. Because, you, you know, you know my... My, my uh, ADD, 
And if I see something I wrote in there, I'll go, I'll go that way instead of the way God intended me to go. So I have a Bible that I just preach out of. And I have a, a, a study by, you know, all this. I've got, you've got so many Bibles laying around in your house, don't you? Many of us do. We take it for granted. What you going to do if somebody comes in and takes it from you? <sighs> no. Under authority, the Supreme Court ruling letter, letter, number, 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 Private citizens are no longer allowed to have copies of God's Word. Could you imagine that ever happening? It's, it's probably going to happen one day. I hope not in my lifetime or no, yours. But you know what is happening right now in other countries? We take, I, listen, we take it for granted. Let me go grab my Bible. Oh, I've got to go do Bible study. I just want us to think about that. I'll tell you what they did. When they found the Word and began to read it, the Bible says they rejoiced. They got happy. I mean, think about what King Josiah did. After, you know, he was so distraught and he rent his clothes and, and he was just so tore up, he began to read. He thought, wow, I didn't know we were supposed to be doing all this. Hey, I didn't know we couldn't do that. Hey, y'all, we're not supposed... I'm sure the King Josiah said, y'all, y'all, we ain't supposed to be doing that. But these are the things that we're supposed to be doing, and we're not. He didn't know. So they got excited about it. Are we excited about God's Word? I, I, I begin to read I, one of, a couple of my favorite scriptures. Psalms chapter 1, verse 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, and in the law doth he meditate day and night. And one of my favorite Psalms is Psalms chapter 63 and verse 6. It says, When I remember thee in my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. I love that. How many of you folks get stirred in the night? Now, I know there's a lot of reasons. You know, we might have to go to the privy. You ever woke up and got, was hungry and had to go get something to eat? <laughs> Am I the only one? <laughs> there's a lot... There's a lot of reasons why we might get woke up. You know, as long as I've been, a, I've been a, a, a fireman for a long time, and it never fails. The tones go off, the beepers goes off, and it's so loud. And there's so many times I'll find myself in the middle of my bedroom thinking, what am I doing? And then they start talking, and they, oh, got a call. <laughs> Sometimes we get stirred in the night. The Bible's a good place to go. Maybe instead of going and turning on the TV or getting on the Internet and, and, and checking out Facebook, we need to get into the Word more. All of us need to make that commitment. They rejoiced. They repented. They came to some understanding when they began to read the book. And the Bible says that they began to turn from their wicked ways. They were sorry that their ancestors had gotten so far away from God that they didn't even know what they're supposed to do. Like, for example, look in chapter 23, verse 1. The Bible says the king summoned all the elders to come into the temple. In verse 2, the Bible says that the king went into the temple and began to read the book. Listen, think about it. The secretary found it and, 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 uh, or told the priest. The priest found it, gave it to the secretary. The secretary brought it back to the king. And the king come in and began to read it to the people. It's important. If we're going to do anything, read the Word is what he's saying. In verse 3, the, king, the Bible says that the king took his place of authority and pledged to obey the book. That's important. But in verse 4, the Bible, in ch chapter 23, verse 4, the Bible says that they threw out all the junk. They got rid of all the idols. The priest, imagine this, priest, priest, that were in the temple doing priestly duties, and they didn't even have the book of the law. So they were just doing whatever that seemed right in their eyes. And we talked about, you know, this, this has been a topic of conversation for a lot of different people. I know I've talked to several of you about it. But think about it. There's churches. There's entire denominations that says, nah, no matter what it says in here, we're going to teach what we want to teach. This is what we think is right. This, that's old. That's old. That doesn't apply today. Some churches, well, I'll just go ahead and say the Episcopal Church, as the entire denomination said, 
they've got a real pretty rainbow flag and says, God is still speaking. And all of that is their campaign to say for the homosexual movement. But I'll tell you something. God has spoken. And God does still speak through His inerrant, infallible Word. And it's not going to change. The Bible says that He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and forevermore. He's not going to change. Yes, the Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. Absolutely. But God will never, never go against His Word. It's set. All right, so they rejoiced, they repented, and they reacted. <laughs> I'd forgotten this saying. I, I saw it a long time ago. When all else fails, read the directions. Now, how many gets that swing set or whatever, you know, um, you get your kid for Christmas and, and, and who? Fellers, do you really look at the instructions? No. You know, it's kind of like a couple of you. <laughs> well, ha, never mind. You know. I don't even got to say what I'm going to say because you already know what I'm going to say. I mean, we always say I should have read the directions first. But the next time I come across something, I think, I don't need no direction. Where's this boat go? <laughs> What's this thing with Jiggy right here? That was supposed to go on the watch we call it, but it didn't happen. Read the instructions. Read the Bible is what we're saying. So, so we begin to, to say, hey, how did they react? Well... Just like us. Just like us. And just like them, for us, if we want to do what's right in the sight of God, remember I said three things. Go find the book, read the book, and the third thing is obey the book. Obey the book. And that's what they did. The people of Judah were disobedient to God because they didn't even know. The Word of God was not there. Folks, We've got to just fill this world with the Word of God. Whether it's through music, whether it's through a radio station, whether it's TV. I, I hope and pray to God right now. It's, it's 11 o'clock right now. My prayer is that somebody is sitting in Ash County watching Channel 1. And they're saying, who in the world is that? And who taught him how to talk? But it's somehow, some way that they're going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Through a song, through a word, we need to obey the book. As I said a while ago, uh, you know, they, they, were, they were disobedient because they didn't know. And we have the word of God everywhere. We are indeed a church where the word is taught. I hope and pray that at the end of the day, that you folks will say about me that I preach the Word. You can, tell, you can say I murdered the English. You can tell me that I said things backwards. You, there's so many things that you can say about me that I don't care about, but I hope that you can say that I preached God's Word. That's the most important thing. Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, 17, all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Literally means God breathed. And it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, but that the man of God might be uh, where he needs to be, that he might know what he's supposed to know. And finally, Psalms 119, verse 105, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How are we supposed to know where to go if we don't read the road map? If we're truly a people of the book, and I want Warrensville Baptist Church to be a people of the book, we must give allegiance to its power and to its authority and to its rightful place in our lives. I know so many of you do. I know so many of you read the Bible every day. Some of you have read the Bible through I don't know how many times. And that's incredible. But perhaps you're here today and there's been a lacking of God's Word in your life. I'd ask you this. Why don't you? Why don't you come and kneel here at the altar, repent, and return to where God wants you to be in that place in your walk. You say, well, I don't want to do that because people think I don't read the Bible. No, they ain't going to think about that. You may be here with something totally else on your mind. God may be dealing with you about something 
completely different. But I want you to know this altar is open if you'd like to come. I'll close on this. I, I, I think about the king. He was the leader. And he, he had the authority to be the leader. And all I wanted to do, what I felt the Lord convict me of, is this. To say, as the pastor of this church, and as one of the leaders of this church, I want to commit myself to making Scripture a priority, not only in my life, but my leadership. And I want to make that commitment to you in that pledge today. Heavenly Father, we just, we just pause here today. I, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much, God, that, that we have your word in such uh, abundance. God, we need, help us, Lord, to absorb this. Help us to absor absorb and meditate upon your word. God, we know that your word is so important. Not mine, no one else's, but your word is so important. And so, God, we just wanted to pause now and through this hymn of invitation, whether it be for something else, God, I pray that you'll put a, a, a spirit, Lord, of, of acceptance in what you're speaking to somebody's heart now. Whether they come to the altar or where, where they stand, God, may we be obedient to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand.